Story 1. The first sign that things weren't going to go well was the bride's infidelity. It wasn't the kind of secret that comes out years later, whispered in dark corners or discovered by accident. No. The groom knew about it from the beginning. She had cheated on him multiple times throughout their relationship, and each time he had chosen to forgive her. Or perhaps it wasn't forgiveness. Maybe it was more of a resignation, a willingness to ignore the pain in the hopes that things would eventually get better. But anyone watching from the outside could see that trust was already broken long before they ever walked down the aisle. Then there were his friends. None of them liked her. They weren't subtle about it either. At every gathering, every pre-wedding event, you could feel the tension in the air. The groom's friends would talk around her, their smiles strained, their laughter forced when she was around. It wasn't just a matter of personal preference or some trivial dislike. They actively couldn't stand her. They saw the cracks in the relationship and the way she treated him, and they hated watching their friend put up with it. He was the kind of guy who wore his heart on his sleeve, who gave everything for the people he loved, and they couldn't understand why he was settling for someone who didn't seem to care for him the same way. Things got worse as the wedding approached. Every time I saw them together, it seemed like they were arguing about something, usually small things that would escalate into bigger issues. It didn't take long to figure out the root cause. The bride didn't trust the groom. She was constantly checking his phone, asking where he was, questioning everything he did. At first, I thought it was odd, considering she was the one with the history of cheating. But then it dawned on me, guilty conscience. It was as if her own guilt had eaten away at any sense of security she had. And instead of confronting it, she projected it onto him. They couldn't even hide it at the wedding. Most couples are supposed to be wrapped up in joy and excitement on their big day. But these two? They barely looked at each other during the ceremony. And when they did, their expressions were tight, forced. You could sense the strain. I was sitting close enough to hear them exchange terse words under their breath during the vows. Something about timing and who was supposed to say what. It was uncomfortable to watch. Like seeing a play go off script in the worst way. Then came the reception. It started out like any other. Clinking glasses, toasts, laughter, though again a bit forced. But there was a tension in the air, something heavy that everyone could feel but no one dared to address. The bride looked beautiful, of course, and the groom, for all his anxiety, tried to keep a smile plastered on his face. They went through the motions, the first dance, the cake cutting, the awkward speeches. But the real show came when the groom's father stood up to speak. He was a quiet man by nature, not someone prone to grand gestures or long-winded speeches. So when he took the microphone, everyone listened closely. At first, it was the usual fare. He congratulated his son, welcomed the bride into the family, talked about how happy he was to see them both so in love. But then, as he was winding down, he dropped the bombshell that no one saw coming. I just hope, he said, pausing for a moment as if to carefully choose his words, that my new daughter-in-law can learn to be faithful. You could hear a pin drop. For a second, there was total silence the kind that makes your heart stop because you know something monumental has just happened. Then, a few muffled gasps and awkward coughs rippled through the room. But the real moment was the bride's reaction. Her face drained of color, her eyes wide with shock and humiliation. She tried to smile, to laugh it off, but it didn't quite reach her eyes. It was as if all the air had been sucked out of her. She glanced at the groom, probably hoping he'd say something, come to her defense. But he just stared down at the table, expressionless, as if he had expected it all along. The rest of the night was a blur of awkwardness. People tried to keep the mood light, but it was impossible to come back from a moment like that. The bride barely spoke for the remainder of the evening, and the groom was even quieter than usual. By the time they left the venue, no one was under any illusion that this was the beginning of a happily ever after. Story 2. One of my closest friends had a whirlwind romance that ended in a wedding in Jamaica. It had all the makings of a picturesque destination ceremony. Tropical sunsets, crystal clear waters, and the kind of setting that should have been the perfect backdrop for love. But the reality of it was far from the idyllic postcard image. They had been together for less than a year, and anyone who knew them could see the warning signs. Their relationship was a constant roller coaster. They fought a lot, not just little disagreements or spats, but full-on arguments that seemed to bubble up at every gathering or event. You could sense the tension between them, the frustration just beneath the surface. Still, they pushed forward announcing their engagement after only a few months of dating. I remember being surprised when I got the wedding invite. It felt too soon, too rushed. They barely knew each other, and from what I'd seen, they didn't seem happy together. But who was I to judge? People do crazy things when they're in love, or when they think they are. The night before the wedding, I got a call from him. It was late, and I could hear the anxiety in his voice the second I picked up. He wasn't drunk, at least not that I could tell, but there was a desperation in the way he spoke, like someone standing at the edge of a cliff, 
unsure whether to jump or back away. He poured his heart out to me, confessing that he didn't think he should go through with it. There's no spark, he said. We fight all the time. I don't think I love her the way I'm supposed to. It was a confession that caught me off guard. This wasn't the first time I'd seen doubts before a wedding, but this was something deeper. It wasn't just cold feet. It was as if he was staring down the barrel of a decision he knew, deep down, was a mistake. I didn't know what to say. Part of me wanted to tell him to call it off, to spare himself and her the heartache of what seemed inevitable. But then I thought about the logistics, the family that had flown out, the money that had been spent, the pressure of a wedding that was just hours away. It felt like too much to unravel in one conversation, so I tried to offer some vague support. Do what feels right for you, I said, though even as I said it, I knew how hollow it sounded. What I didn't know at the time was that I wasn't the only one getting that call. It wasn't until months later that I found out he had reached out to seven other people that same night, pouring out the same fears, asking the same questions. Eight of us in total, all hearing the same confession, all knowing that he was desperately hoping one of us would tell him to stop. I think that's what he was really looking for, someone to step in, to give him permission to pull the plug, to take the weight of that decision off his shoulders. But none of us did. The next day he got married. I wasn't at the ceremony, but I heard it was beautiful, the kind of wedding that looks perfect on the surface. His bride looked stunning. The pictures were gorgeous, and from all outward appearances, they were a happy couple starting their new life together. But everyone who had gotten that phone call the night before knew the truth, that beneath the smiles and the vows, something was already broken. It didn't take long for things to unravel. They fought constantly, just like before, only now it was worse. They had made the ultimate commitment, and now there was no easy way out. Every argument seemed heavier, loaded with the weight of their rushed decision to get married. The honeymoon phase, if there ever was one, was short-lived. Less than a year later, I heard through the grapevine that they had separated. They lasted one year and two weeks, barely enough time to get the wedding photos framed before it all came crashing down. Story 3. Her smile faltered just for a moment, but it was enough. You could see it in her eyes, the way she tried to keep her expression composed, even though she must have been blindsided. Here she was, a woman who had dedicated the last several years of her life to her education, preparing to embark on a grueling journey through medical school, and her new husband was talking about her giving it all up. The future he was so excited about was one where she'd step away from everything she had worked for and become the wife and mother he envisioned. The truth was she had no intention of having children anytime soon. She had a plan. Four more years of medical school, residency, and then maybe she'd think about starting a family. But that wasn't something they had agreed upon in some distant, hypothetical way. It was something she had been crystal clear about from the start. She wasn't willing to sacrifice her dreams or hard work to fit into some idealized role of a stay-at-home mom. She had aspirations and nothing, not even love, was going to derail that. Or so she thought. The wedding came and went, and as the honeymoon phase faded, the reality of their differences hit like a brick wall. His expectations became clearer, more persistent. He wanted her to start a family right away, to shift her focus from her career to their home life. She was baffled. How could he think that after all the years she'd spent working toward her goal of becoming a doctor, she would simply give it up? Their arguments escalated quickly. At first, it was small comments, subtle digs about her priorities. He'd suggest she didn't care enough about their relationship, that she was too focused on her career. He'd make comments about how they'd never have a proper family if she kept pushing back the timeline for kids. At first, she brushed it off, thinking he'd come around once school started, that he'd see how important her work was to her. But things got worse. After they were married, it was as though he believed he had a say in her choices, like he expected her consent to his vision of their life, just because they'd said vows. The discussions about kids weren't just suggestions any; they became demands. He started bringing it up constantly, as if her commitment to medical school and her career was somehow a betrayal of their marriage. He didn't seem to understand, or perhaps didn't want to understand, that she wasn't willing to be the person he imagined in his fantasies, a stay-at-home mom who abandoned her dreams to raise his children. It was heartbreaking to watch from the sidelines. She was caught in this awful situation, realizing that the man she thought loved and supported her had a completely different vision of their future, one that didn't include her ambitions. He didn't just want a partner, he wanted someone to fit the mold he had already cast. And worse, he didn't seem to care that her dreams, her identity, and her sense of self-worth were being crushed under the weight of his expectations. They lasted a year. By the end of it, she was emotionally drained, disillusioned and utterly heartbroken. The final straw came when she realized that now that they were married, he didn't think she had the right to refuse consent, not just about the kids, but about their entire life together. In his mind, being his wife meant surrendering her autonomy. It was as though marriage had granted him control over her decisions, her body, and her future. 
The divorce wasn't pretty, but it was necessary. She walked away from that marriage scarred but resolute, more determined than ever to pursue her dreams. The saddest part of it all was realizing that the man she had once thought loved her was more in love with the idea of who he thought she should be, rather than who she actually was. Story 4. I've spent a lot of time reflecting on my own wedding day. On the surface, everything seemed perfect. The venue was beautiful, the weather was just right, and the people closest to us were there, celebrating what appeared to be a flawless union. No one, as far as I know, had any doubts about whether we should be together. In fact, it seemed like everyone around us believed we were a great match. We had been together for a long time, and it felt like the natural progression of things. Marriage, a life together, possibly starting a family. But what I didn't know at the time was that there was one person who had doubts, the bride herself. My wife, she hit it remarkably well. To this day, I still struggle with whether I believe her when she says she never really wanted to be married in the first place. She just didn't show it. Not on the day of the wedding. Not leading up to it. Not even in the months we were engaged. Everything seemed so genuine, so heartfelt. During the ceremony, I remember her smiling at me in that way that made me feel like the luckiest man alive. She even cried a few times and they weren't tears of stress or anxiety. They were tears of joy. At least that's how I saw them. She spoke about how perfect everything was. Not just once, but throughout the entire day. As we danced and laughed with friends and family, she kept telling me how happy she was how everything had turned out exactly as she'd imagined. It felt like we were on the same page, starting a life together with mutual excitement and love. But half a year later, everything unraveled. She sat me down one evening and told me something that shook me to my core. She claimed she had never truly wanted to get married. She said that from the beginning, she felt like she had been forced into it, that she had gone through with the wedding not because it was what she wanted, but because she felt it was expected of her. I couldn't believe it. I didn't understand. How could someone feel that way and hide it so well? How could she have seemed so happy, so invested if she had doubts all along? I kept replaying the wedding day in my mind, trying to pinpoint moments where maybe I had missed something. An expression, a hesitation, anything that might have been a clue. But I found nothing. Even now, it's hard for me to fully accept her claims. I remember the love in her eyes, the way she held my hand, the way she told me how much she loved me. It all felt so real. So when she told me she had never wanted any of it, it felt like my entire perception of that day had been shattered. She explained that the pressure had been building for a long time. We had been together for years, and there was this unspoken expectation from everyone around us, our families, our friends, even ourselves, that marriage was the next step. It wasn't that we weren't happy together, but the relationship had reached a point where it felt like not getting married would have been seen as a failure. And so, she went along with it, convincing herself that maybe it was what she wanted, even though deep down, it wasn't. In the end, she said she felt trapped. Trapped by the weight of other people's expectations. By the idea that she owed it to me and to the life we had built to go through with it. But she also felt trapped by her own fear. Fear of disappointing everyone. Fear of breaking my heart. Fear of admitting to herself that maybe marriage just wasn't for her. And so she played the part. She put on the dress, she smiled for the photos, and she said her vows. And for those first few months, it seemed like she was convincing even herself that it was what she wanted. But eventually, the cracks started to show. I noticed her growing distant, more withdrawn. The conversations we used to have about our future started to feel strained. And every time I brought up the idea of starting a family, she would change the subject or brush it off. I didn't push it too much, thinking she just needed more time to adjust. I never realized that beneath the surface, she was grappling with a deep sense of regret, a feeling that she had made a decision she couldn't live with. When she finally admitted the truth, it was like a weight had been lifted off her shoulders but it landed squarely on mine. I was devastated, not just because our marriage was falling apart, but because I felt like I had been living a lie. I had thought we were building something beautiful, and now I had to face the reality that she had never truly wanted the life I thought we were creating. We divorced shortly after that conversation, and while it was painful, it was also a harsh lesson in the importance of honesty, both with yourself and with the people you love. Story 5. My wife and I got married in the Catholic Church, which meant we had to go through a pre-Cana session. For those who don't know, it's a pre-marriage counseling program the church requires before they'll marry you. At the time, we thought the whole thing was total nonsense. We weren't particularly religious then, and now we're essentially atheists. But we went through with it anyway, mostly to appease our parents and keep the peace. We were expecting it to be a waste of time, something we'd just sit through, nod along to, and then promptly forget about once we checked it off the list. But in hindsight, it turned out to be a much better idea than we anticipated. 
What we thought would be a formality actually offered some important insights into the minds of other couples, and even our own relationship. There were five other couples in the session with us, all of them on the cusp of their wedding day, just like we were. The session started off pretty standard, introductions, a bit about the meaning of marriage in the church, that kind of thing. Then the counselor running the session asked a very simple but crucial question. What do you think marriage will be like? What are you expecting? We were asked to write our answers down individually, swap them with our partner, and then read them aloud to the group. My wife and I thought, sure, easy enough. I jotted down some things about partnership, shared responsibility, love, mutual respect, you know, the things that make up a life together. My wife wrote something similar, and when we swapped answers, it was comforting to see that we were pretty much on the same page. But then the other couple started to share their answers, and that's when things got interesting. And by interesting, I mean alarming. Every single woman in the group, except my wife, interpreted the question completely differently. For them, marriage wasn't about life after the wedding. It was about the wedding day itself. Their answers were all descriptions of the big day. What kind of dress they'd be wearing, how big the limo would be, who would do their hair, what kind of food would be served at the reception, and what venue they'd chosen. It wasn't just one or two of them either. It was all of them. At first, I thought maybe they were just joking or being superficial as a way to break the ice. But no, they were dead serious. I glanced over at the counselor, who looked slightly horrified, though she tried to hide it. You could see her brain working overtime, trying to steer the conversation back to the real meaning of the question, what they expected marriage itself to be like, beyond the wedding day. But when she gently probed further, it became clear that none of them had thought much about life after the honeymoon. It was like their entire concept of marriage was centered on the event. The white dress, the flowers, the party. Not one of them mentioned anything about their expectations for a life together with their partner about how they imagined navigating the day-to-day -day challenges of marriage, or what kind of partnership they hoped to build. It was all about the wedding, not the marriage. My wife and I exchanged a glance, both of us thinking the same thing. This can't be good. After the session, we spent a lot of time talking about it. We were both struck by how little those couples seemed to have discussed their expectations for married life. It was eye-opening, and frankly, a little scary to realize how many people leap into marriage without having those fundamental conversations. The counselor didn't say it outright, but the message was clear. If you're going into marriage focused only on the wedding, you're in for a rude awakening when real life starts. I don't know what happened to the other couples we shared that session with. I'm sure some of them are still together, but I wouldn't be surprised if a few of them have already divorced. It's not just a cynical guess either. The statistics speak for themselves. The divorce rate is a reflection of how many people don't have those critical discussions before saying, I do. They don't talk about expectations, roles, values, or the tough stuff like finances, kids, or even how they'll handle conflict. And then, after the wedding day, magic wears off. Reality hits hard. If there's one thing that pre cana taught us, it's the importance of being on the same page before you commit to a life together. You can't go into marriage with blinders on, thinking everything will just magically work out. You have to talk about the real stuff, the hard stuff. Story 6. The relationship was troubled from the start. They had been together for barely five months when the groom proposed, not out of a deep, mutual desire to spend their lives together, but because of yet another demand for a proof-of-love gesture from the bride. It was a dynamic that had defined their relationship from early on. This constant need for reassurance, for grand acts that would somehow cement their commitment to each other. But even at that point, the cracks were already visible to anyone who cared to look closely. When they got engaged, it wasn't because they had taken the time to really get to know each other, to talk about their future, or to discuss what marriage truly meant. It was because the bride, for reasons we could only guess at, needed that ring on her finger to feel secure. It was almost like the proposal was a bandage to cover up the deeper issues, rather than a genuine step forward. And the groom? He went along with it, perhaps out of guilt or obligation, maybe because he didn't know how to say no. So they got engaged, and things didn't improve. In fact, a few months later, they made the impulsive decision to move the wedding forward by two whole years. The reason? to prove that the groom still loved her. It was a bizarre, desperate move that raised a lot of eyebrows among those who knew them. People questioned it, of course. How could rushing into a wedding solve anything? But they were determined, convinced that sealing the deal with vows would somehow fix the underlying insecurities and trust issues. The wedding itself was, on the surface, a beautiful event. But anyone close to the couple could feel the tension. There was an uncomfortable sense that everything was being forced, that neither of them was truly ready for what marriage entailed. They hadn't had the time to grow as a couple, to build a foundation based on trust and understanding. Instead, they were sprinting toward the finish line of marriage as if it would provide the answers they were so desperately searching for. A year has passed since then, 
And though they're still technically together, their relationship has spiraled into something toxic, something dangerous. They are at the point where every day feels like a battleground. They fight constantly, sometimes over small things, sometimes over nothing at all. The arguments have become so vicious, so deeply unhealthy, that it feels like they are teetering on the edge of destruction. The groom, once passive in the face of her demands, has grown bitter and angry. The love that they once tried so hard to prove now seems like a distant memory, if it ever existed at all. He's reached the point where his words cut like knives. He tells her to go terminate herself, a cruel reference to a past incident that still haunts everyone who knows them. I was the one who found her last time. When she had tried to end it all, it was one of the darkest moments I've ever witnessed. And the fact that he now throws it back in her face during their arguments shows just how far their relationship has deteriorated. It's not just unhealthy, it's toxic in the most dangerous way. She, in turn, clings even more tightly to the marriage, as if it's the only thing holding her together, even though it's clear that it's the very thing tearing her apart. It's a vicious cycle. This need for validation, this desire to prove something to each other, when in reality, all they've done is prove how ill-suited they are as partners. They fight, they hurt each other, and yet they stay together, bound by promises made in haste and out of fear rather than love. It's heartbreaking to witness. We, the people around them, see the pain, the dysfunction, and we feel powerless to help. They're so wrapped up in their own toxic dance that any advice or concern we try to offer falls on death. They've built a life together, but it's one founded on a shaky, fragile ground. Every day they teeter closer to collapse, and we're left to watch and hope that they'll find a way out before it's too late. There were more things that happened at the wedding itself, things that, if I shared, would make the story too specific, too recognizable. But the signs were there even then. The rushed ceremony, the undercurrent of anxiety, the forced smiles. Anyone who knew them well enough could sense that this wasn't going to end well. And now here we are, watching it all unfold in real time, hoping they'll realize what they're doing to each other before it's too late. Story 7. Back in college, I became good friends with a girl who was going through a situation that, at the time, seemed so far removed from anything I could relate to. Her parents had arranged for her to get married. Now, arranged marriages weren't something I was familiar with, but it was part of her culture, and though she often talked about it, I didn't really grasp just how deeply it was affecting her. She didn't seem excited about the prospect, but I figured it was just nerves. Everyone gets a little anxious before big life changes, right? One day, though, it became clear that it was more than just nerves. I remember it vividly. We were sitting in class when I noticed her wiping away tears. She was trying to be discreet, but it was obvious something was wrong. After class, I suggested we head to the bar to unwind, and that's when everything poured out. She was absolutely devastated. She told me that her parents were pushing her into marrying this guy, someone she barely knew and had no feelings for. The pressure from her family was immense, and she felt trapped. She wasn't just upset about the marriage itself. She was angry and resentful at the situation she had been forced into. She cried and told me that she didn't want to marry him, that he made her uncomfortable, that she couldn't even imagine spending a life with him. I tried to comfort her as best I could, but it was clear she felt like there was no way out. Her family's expectations weighed heavily on her, and in her eyes, refusing wasn't an option. A few months later, I found myself at her wedding. It was surreal, standing there watching everything unfold. The venue was beautiful, the decorations meticulously planned, and the air was filled with celebration. But underneath the surface, you could sense something was off. The bride, my friend, wasn't smiling. There was a heaviness to her movements, a stiffness that made it clear this wasn't her dream day. When they introduced the bride and groom, I held my breath, hoping maybe I had misunderstood her feelings or that somehow things had improved between them. But that hope was quickly shattered. As the groom leaned in to kiss her, she didn't reciprocate. Instead, she smushed his face with her palm, pushing him away. The whole room froze and I felt a pit in my stomach. This wasn't just awkward. This was a full-on rejection in front of everyone. It didn't stop there. Throughout the night, she refused to dance with him. People tried to coax her into joining the celebration, but she stayed distant. And at one point, I even heard her yell, He's F asterisk 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 in gross! The whole thing was painfully uncomfortable. Guests were whispering, and the atmosphere turned tense. It was clear that this marriage, despite the grand celebration, was doomed from the start. After the wedding, I couldn't stay in touch with her the way I would have liked. This was when Facebook was just starting to take off, and staying connected wasn't as easy as it is now. I wondered about her sometimes, about how she was managing in what seemed like a nightmare of a situation. I thought about reaching out but never really had a way to. Then, a couple of years later, I bumped into her by chance. She looked different, lighter, freer somehow. 
The first thing she said to me when we started talking was, we were divorced three months later. She didn't even have to explain. The relief on her face said it all. I wasn't surprised, to be honest. That wedding felt like a funeral for her independence. And seeing her that night, so disconnected from the man she was marrying, it was clear that it couldn't last. She told me how miserable those three months had been, how much guilt she'd carried for not being able to make it work, but also how liberating it was to finally break free from the marriage. Her parents had eventually come to terms with it, though it had been a rocky road. In the end, she was grateful to be out of it, even though the experience had left deep emotional scars. As we talked, I couldn't help but think back to the wedding, and with a pang of regret, remembered the generous monetary gift I'd given. At the time, I had hoped that maybe, despite everything, they could find some happiness together. But now it felt like I had unknowingly supported a union that had brought her nothing but pain. I guess part of me still wishes I could have done more to help her avoid the whole situation, though I realize now that wasn't really in my control. The gift seemed like a small thing in the grand scheme of it all. But still, knowing what I know now, I wish I had given her something more meaningful, like the courage to stand up for herself before it ever got that far. Story 8. The bride-to-be was flirting with one of the bartenders. A lot. She wasn't being subtle either. Several of us at the firm noticed it. Enough that there were jokes and comments made throughout the night about how friendly she was with him. Some of us laughed it off, thinking it was just harmless flirting. After all, she was getting married soon. Who would take it seriously? But the vibe was off. There was something about the way she was glued to the bartender that seemed more than just playful. The wedding came and went, and as far as anyone knew, it went off without a hitch. The newlyweds spent their honeymoon in St. Thomas enjoying a picturesque week in paradise. Nothing out of the ordinary, no major signs that anything was wrong. In fact, after they returned, things seemed great. A couple of months after the honeymoon, she announced to everyone that she was pregnant. She was glowing with happiness, overjoyed to be starting a family with her husband. It was the kind of news that made you think, well, maybe the flirting was nothing after all. We worked in public accounting, so during busy season, we were working 70, 80 hours a week. It wasn't uncommon to see her almost every day. She would stop by to bring her husband dinner, and they always looked so affectionate, so in love. It was the kind of relationship that, from the outside, seemed solid. They had been together for years before getting married, and now with a baby on the way, it seemed like they were settling into the next phase of their life. Then, when she was eight months pregnant, she dropped a bombshell that no one saw coming. She confessed to her husband that the baby wasn't his. It was the bartenders, the same bartender she had been flirting with the night we all went out to celebrate her wedding. Apparently, she had been cheating on him with the bartender, not just before the wedding, but after the wedding as well. It wasn't a one-time mistake. It was an ongoing affair. And now, she was carrying the bartender's baby. The fallout was intense. Her husband was devastated, as you'd expect. He had been under the impression that they were starting their life together, building a family. Instead, he found out that his entire marriage had been built on lies. It wasn't just the infidelity that hurt. It was the fact that she had gone through with the wedding, stood there and said vows, all while continuing to betray him. The fact that she had kept up the facade, bringing him dinner, spending time with him, acting like everything was normal, made it all the more painful. Soon after, she told everyone at work about the impending divorce. She was heartbroken, crying as she explained the mess she had made of her life. She moved out of the home she had shared with her husband and into the bartender's house, though house might be a generous term. It was more like a small, rundown rental that was worlds away from the life she had been living with her husband, and it didn't take long for things to fall apart with the bartender, too. Within months of moving in with him, the fight started. She would come into work complaining about how difficult things were with her new boyfriend, how they argued all the time. It was clear that her decision to leave her husband and pursue this affair had backfired spectacularly. She had traded stability and a loving relationship for something toxic and unsustainable. Karma had come around quickly, and she was now stuck in a situation that was far worse than what she had before. I know it might sound harsh, but I couldn't help but take a bit of satisfaction in watching her deal with the consequences of her actions. She had completely wrecked her husband's life by going through with the wedding while actively cheating on him, and now she was living out the fallout of her own bad decisions. It wasn't just that she had made a mistake. She had deliberately chosen to deceive her husband, all while pretending to be happy and in love. To see her struggling in this new relationship, constantly fighting with the man she had betrayed her husband for, felt like a kind of poetic justice. She had chased after something forbidden, thinking it would bring her happiness, but in the end, it had only brought her misery. She had destroyed a marriage, hurt someone who genuinely loved her, and now she was trapped in a cycle of conflict with a man who clearly wasn't the answer to her problems. Karma can be cruel, but in this case, it seemed well-deserved. Story 9. Looking back, 
It's hard to believe how well my sister hid her pain. On the outside, her wedding was beautiful, everything she had dreamed of. Family and friends were there, smiling and cheering her on as she walked down the aisle to marry the man she thought she would spend the rest of her life with. But none of us, not even me, her own sister, had any idea what was about to unfold behind closed doors that very night. I only found out the truth much later, after everything had fallen apart. My sister confided in me that her wedding night, of all nights, was the first time her new husband physically abused her. It was shocking, heartbreaking, to think that this man, who had stood up in front of everyone, promised to love and protect her, had turned into someone so monstrous the moment they were alone. She didn't tell anyone at first. She kept it hidden, maybe out of fear, maybe out of confusion, or perhaps the hope that it was a one-time thing. I can only imagine the emotional whirlwind she must have gone through. After all, what do you do when on what's supposed to be the happiest day of your life, the person you just vowed to love forever turns into a nightmare? She must have felt trapped, ashamed even, not knowing how to reconcile the man she had married with the one who had just hurt her. The abuse didn't stop that night. Over time, it got worse, but she still kept it a secret. She became distant, quieter than usual, but I thought it was just the stress of adjusting to married life. She never mentioned the bruises, the fights, or the fear she was living with daily. Her husband to everyone else still seemed like a decent guy. He was polite, friendly, and charming in public. No one would have suspected the darkness that lingered behind the facade. But that's the thing about abuse. It's often invisible to those who aren't living in it. It wasn't until my husband and I learned the truth that we realized just how much she had been hiding. She finally broke down admitting everything. The manipulation, the control, the violence. It was like a dam bursting. All the emotions she had kept locked away spilling out in one painful confession. I felt so many things in that moment. Anger, guilt for not realizing sooner, and above all, the desperate need to protect her. We didn't waste any time. My husband and I made a plan to get her out of there. I remember the night we went to her house, carefully, quietly, making sure her husband wouldn't suspect anything. We packed up her things, the essentials, and drove her back to our place. I'll never forget the look on her face as she finally stepped out of that house. Her body tense with fear, but also a glimmer of hope that maybe, just maybe, she was getting out for good. That was the beginning of her journey to freedom. The divorce wasn't easy, of course. Her husband fought her every step of the way, trying to manipulate her into staying, or at least into believing that she was the one who was wrong. But by then, she had seen too much, experienced too much pain to fall for his tactics. With the support of our family and some great legal help, she was able to finalize the divorce and leave him behind. The years since then have been nothing short of transformative for her. At first, it was hard. Healing from the trauma of abuse isn't something that happens overnight. There were many ups and downs, nights when the fear would come back, and days when she doubted herself. But slowly, she found herself again. She started doing things that made her happy, surrounding herself with people who genuinely cared about her well-being. And most importantly, she started believing in her own worth again. Now, several years later, my sister is in a much better place. She's free from that abusive marriage, and she's finally living the life she deserves. She's been divorced for a while, and the joy in her face now is something I hadn't seen in years. What makes it even better is that she's about to start a new chapter. She's going to graduate school in a few months, something she's been dreaming of for a long time. Story 10. She was also morbidly obese and had this bizarre expectation that her fiancé should eat like. Every meal had to be an event, and not in the good way. She seemed to take it personally that her soon-to-be husband didn't want to eat the massive portions she served up portions that looked like they were meant for an NFL lineman. The more he tried to maintain his own eating habits, the more upset she got. It was as if she expected him to be an extension of herself in every way, including her unhealthy relationship with food. But the real problem wasn't just the food or the cursing. It was the way she treated him overall. We could all see it, but he was either blind to it or in denial. A few of us tried to talk to him before the wedding. We told him that he didn't have to go through with it, that this was clearly a bad idea. His reaction? He got furious. He wouldn't hear it, insisting that we didn't know what we were talking about and that he was committed to her. We all reluctantly backed off, figuring it was his life to live. But deep down, we knew this wasn't going to end well. The wedding itself went off without too much trouble. But the reception? That was a different story. It was one for the ages and not in a good way. She started the night by getting drunk in the limo on the way to the venue. By the time they arrived, she was already sloppy. And in her drunken state, she thought it'd be a great idea to flash her chest to all the groomsmen. It was one of those moments where you couldn't help but look away, but not fast enough. Let's just say it wasn't exactly a sight anyone wanted to see. The groomsmen were trying their best to play it off, but the awkwardness was palpable. The dinner was a buffet, and when she approached the food, it was as if she had been starving for days. 
She piled her plate high, creating a little mountain of food, then went back for seconds. People at the tables were starting to exchange glances. The more she drank, the worse things got. When it was time for the first dance, she was so drunk that she could barely stand. Her new husband had to practically hold her up to keep her from collapsing. He was trying to pretend it was this beautiful, romantic moment, but everyone could see how far gone she was. It was uncomfortable to watch. At the dinner table, she took things to a whole new level of inappropriate. In between stuffing her face, she decided to brag, loudly, about her oral skills. And this wasn't just among her bridesmaids. She included the groom's mother in the conversation. Yes, she went there, right in front of his mom. We all sat there, stunned, unable to believe she had actually said it. Any sense of decorum or class was out the window, and there was no coming back from it. The entire reception felt like a slow-motion disaster, and there was nothing anyone could do to stop it. By the end of the night, she was so drunk that two of the groomsmen had to physically carry her to their room. She was still in her dress, completely passed out. The groom looked exhausted and embarrassed, but he put on a brave face as if this was just another bump in the road. For the rest of us, though, the writing was already on the wall. Three months later, the whole situation took a turn for the worse. They were in an argument. No one knows what started it, but she lost control. In a fit of rage, she stabbed him with a knife. It wasn't a superficial injury either. She was arrested for felony assault. That was finally the wake-up call he needed. After all the red flags, the warnings, the disastrous wedding, it took a near-death experience for him to realize what we had all been saying. This marriage was a mistake. He filed for divorce soon after, and thank God he did. Looking back, we all felt a mix of relief and frustration. It was hard to see him go through something so destructive, but at least he eventually got out. As for her, no one really knows what happened to her after the arrest. She just sort of disappeared from our lives as quickly as she had stormed into them. But one thing's for sure, none of us will ever forget that wedding or the lessons it taught us about ignoring the obvious signs. Story 11. At first glance, everything seemed perfect at the wedding. The bride looked stunning in her white gown and her groom beamed with pride as they stood side by side. The day, however, held a peculiar undertone, one that didn't go unnoticed by the guests in attendance. While the groom's family was dressed to the nines, ready to celebrate the couple's big day, the bride's family appeared, well, underdressed. It wasn't that they lacked love for her, but their casual attire stood in stark contrast to the formal atmosphere of the occasion. The only exception was her brother, who had clearly put in the effort to look the part, matching the tone of the celebration. It was as though he alone understood the magnitude of the day. As the reception carried on, many guests began to notice subtle but significant gaps in what is traditionally expected at a wedding. One particular moment that tugged at people's hearts was when the bride, instead of having the typical father-daughter dance, shared the spotlight with her brother. The absence of her father loomed over the moment like a shadow. And while her brother held her close and tried to make the dance special, the bride's eyes glistened with tears. She did her best to hold them back, but the emotion of the moment overwhelmed her. As they swayed to the music, the deep bond between the siblings became evident. Whatever was going on behind the scenes with her family, her brother remained her rock, offering comfort and a sense of normalcy on a day that should have been filled with nothing but joy. When the dance ended, her brother escorted her back to her seat. Despite the fact that it was early in the evening, the bride's family, with the exception of her brother, began to gather their things to leave. There was no dramatic exit, no argument or scene, just a quiet departure that left more questions than answers. The groom's family, noticing the bride's loved ones leaving prematurely, couldn't help but wonder why. They adored her from the moment they met her, embracing her as part of their own family, and they couldn't understand why her own relatives seemed so distant and unsupportive on such a significant day. Whispers passed from one table to the next, but no one could piece together the reasons behind the early departure or the somber emotions that had taken over the bride during what should have been one of the happiest moments of her life. Time passed and life carried on. The couple remained deeply in love, standing strong through the unspoken complexities surrounding the bride's family. Whatever tensions or history existed remained private, as neither the bride nor her husband ever publicly addressed the situation. They focused on building their own life together, eventually welcoming their first child, a baby boy, into the world. The arrival of their son brought new joy into their lives, filling their days with laughter and love. The groom's family, of course, was thrilled to welcome the newest addition, showering the couple and their baby with endless support. Story 12. I know I'm super late sharing this, but trust me, this story is too wild to keep to myself. It all started with a family friend's daughter who had recently announced that she was pregnant. Naturally, the couple decided to do what many couples in their situation feel pressured to do, get married. The wedding day arrived, and there was this buzz of excitement in the air as guests, including myself, gathered outside the venue, waiting for the ceremony to begin. 
You could tell people were happy for them, despite the whirlwind circumstances. As we stood around chatting, waiting for the bride to make her grand entrance, something truly unexpected happened. Out of nowhere, this woman, who no one seemed to recognize, stormed in. She wasn't just any uninvited guest either. She was on a mission, demanding to see the groom. Her voice was sharp, cutting through the air, and she wasn't about to leave until she spoke with him. You could feel the tension ripple through the crowd as we all turned to watch the drama unfold. At first, I thought maybe it was just a misunderstanding, but then she dropped the bombshell. She loudly proclaimed that she was also pregnant. With the groom's child! You could literally hear Jaws hitting the floor as the realization spread through the guests like wildfire. People started whispering to each other, trying to make sense of the situation. Was this some kind of joke? Was this woman for real? As much as we all tried to be subtle about watching, it was like a train wreck you couldn't look away from. The bride, groom, and this mystery woman disappeared behind closed doors with a small group of close family members, leaving the rest of us standing there in disbelief. The murmurs grew louder as we speculated about what could possibly be going on inside. The whole place was buzzing with anticipation, but it didn't feel like the joyful kind that typically surrounds a wedding. More like we were about to witness a full-blown catastrophe. Time seemed to drag on forever, but after what felt like an eternity, the doors finally opened, and much to everyone's surprise, the wedding was still happening. The bride emerged, her face looking a little tense but composed, and the ceremony continued as though nothing had happened. We were all shocked. How could they possibly go on with the wedding after such a dramatic interruption? Was this some sort of denial? Or had they somehow managed to resolve the situation? The ceremony went off without another hitch, but you could feel the weird energy in the air. There was an unspoken understanding that this wasn't a happily ever after moment. It was more like the calm before an inevitable storm. As the night wore on, people seemed to try to shake off the earlier incident, but I could tell it was still on everyone's minds. A few weeks after the wedding, the truth came out. The woman who had stormed into the wedding was telling the truth after all. Not only was she pregnant with the groom's child, but both babies, his child with the bride and his child with the mystery woman, were born just two weeks apart. It was like something out of a soap opera. The bride and the other woman were both raising children fathered by the same man at nearly the same time. To no one's surprise, the marriage didn't last. The couple split up not long after their child was born, the weight of the betrayal proving too much for the relationship to handle. I remember the reception being cut short as well. After all the drama, we didn't stick around for too long. We quietly grabbed a piece of cake before slipping out early. I can confirm that the cake was excellent, even if the marriage was doomed from the start. 